Uh, will be, as you know, opening in uh, late October or October 21st. And uh, it covers uh, an overall span of about 250 years. So starting in uh, the early 18th century, 1707 roughly, and going up until the 1940s, uh, 1947. And so the colonialism section of this, as you can imagine, comes uh, towards the late end of the overall exhibition narrative. And here is the catalog, which you've seen on many an occasion, probably. And uh, I think there are, you can have this uh, to look through. That's Karen's uh, area. But for this uh, conversation today, I'd like to focus on uh, one particular moment in the, the history of colonialism. And that is uh, the Imperial Darbar, or the Carnation Assembly that was uh, held in uh, Delhi in 1903. And um, the, the, my launching off point for this, and pretty much everything you will see here, is from a photographic album that was uh, uh, specially produced to commemorate this event. And this uh, album is in the museum's collection, and uh, one of its pages will be on view in the exhibition. So, uh, can you just can get the lights down, please? Thank you. Lots of black and white photos you will be seeing here. So on December 29, 1902, the city of Delhi was transformed for 12 days into a pageant. Tens of thousands of people came from across the country and across the seas, and they had gathered there for a fortnight long festivities to celebrate the coronation of Edward VII. Uh, Edward VII had succeeded his mother, Queen Victoria, as, queen, uh, as king of uh, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and of the British dominions, and he was also the emperor of India. So uh, the short talk here uh, will focus on the single event in Indian history, which is representative of the very complex political, cultural, and social elements that marked India at the turn of the 20th century, and which uh, in some ways can also help uh, contextualize some aspects of the India that we know of today. So, um, sorry, I'm still trying to get this volume distance relationship. So uh, in the next 30 odd minutes, uh, we will look at the elaborate festivities uh, of Edward VII's Coronation Darbar, or the uh, Imperial Assembly. And as I said, mostly this is through the photographs in an album compiled uh, in by a Madras, or which is modern Chennai, Madras-based photography studio of Fila and Klein. And uh, as uh, this, advertisement also said that, that they had uh, studios in other parts of India, especially Utakamun, which was a popular British uh, hill resort in uh, central India. And this is what the cover of the album looks like. Uh, and after going through the overall uh, walkthrough of the festivities and the types of uh, uh, events planned for this uh, ceremony, I will uh, then briefly talk about the symbolism of the event and the ways in which aspects of Indian rituals became a means of legitimizing British presence in India. So what was the Darbar? Uh, the 1902-1903, Darbar was the second of three imperial assemblies staged in India to honor British monarchs. The first, um, this is just a view from the inside, uh, another image from the album. The first was held in 1877 to celebrate uh, what was called the Royal Titles Act, uh, which proclaimed uh, Queen Victoria as the Queen Empress of India, or the Kaisare Hind. And the next event was this one, uh, the 1902 uh, 
1902-1903 event to celebrate the accession of Victoria's eldest son, Edward VII, and was the last of, uh, and then third Darbar, the last one, was the coronation of Edward's successor, George V, in 1911. And one more Darbar was planned in 1936 to honor George, George VI, but it never took place. He was the one who abdicated the throne, and uh, many of you may have seen King's speech. He was the brother of Colin Firth. So uh, the event never happened. When Queen Victoria died in 1901 and Edward assumed the throne, Lord George Curzon, the then Viceroy and Governor General, uh, who was a holder of the highest office of British administration in India, invited the new King Emperor to India. After much deliberation in London, it was eventually decided that Edward himself would be unable to leave England for the long duration that a trip such as this would require. Instead, his brother, the Duke of Connaught, was deputed to represent him. Curzon was very disappointed by this news. And here you can see a rather impressive, almost Napoleonic, uh, image of him. Uh, but Curzon was nonetheless determined to make the event a majestic affair and I quote, the biggest thing ever seen in India. Bigger and more elaborate, and, end quote. Uh, it was, he wanted it to be bigger and more elaborate than the earlier 1877 assembl imperial assemblage, which had set a precedent for uh, these subsequent events. However, the non-attendance of the King Emperor left the Viceroy, that is, Curzon himself, to represent the King's authority, uh, as according to the Constitution, uh, he was to hold, uh, Curzon, was uh, to hold a higher status at the ceremony than the King's brother, the Duke of Connaught. So this situation surely must have suited the very ambitious and dynamic Curzon. Uh, he personally oversaw the planning of the Darbar, preparations for which had taken up most of the year of 1902. He planned the 12 day long program of events. Uh, this is a painting that will be in the exhibition. Uh, he planned the program of events, the architecture of the arena, the layout of the camp, the movement and accommodation of over 150,000 people. Uh, and oversaw details such as the width of the roads, the placement of tents, and the planting of flower beds. He even chose the hymns that were to be sung at the church service. So he was very hands-on and in, very actively involved in this. The scale of arrangements was extensive and enormous. Arrangements were made for a road network, water supplies, sanitary facilities, and amenities such as bazaars, a post and telegraph service, electrical lighting, medical facilities, and a special police force. A huge campsite was set up to accommodate the many visitors and their entourage. Special camps were allotted to the Maharajas, uh, heads of provincial governments, senior generals, and British uh, agents and residents at the princely states. The Viceroy's camp it consisted of no less than 2,774 people and included 138 guests, 266 rickshaw coolies, 283 policemen, and 1,190 servants. This was just for Curzon's personal use, uh, or that for his immediate purposes. The guests included friends, relatives, and members of royalty. Um, the Indian rulers were instructed to bring their own tents, equipment, and to completely provide for all their personal needs and those of their large entourage. And so as another example of the scale of the enterprise, elaborate railway schedules had to be worked out in order to transport the thousands of retainers and animals that accompanied the various Maharajas. Instructions were also given to the Maharajas for maintaining their camps in a fashion that befitted their status. And here are just some of the uh, entrances to individual Maharaja's camps. 
Uh, one Darbar attendee, the British traveler, writer, archaeologist, uh, and much more, uh, Gertrude Bell, writes that the Maharaja of Patiala, and I quote, has his tents arranged around an enchanting garden, the beds of green cress instead of grass, graveled with little paths full of flowers, and all called out of the part sand for the sake of this fortnight. And just as an aside, uh, this is a Maharaja uh, who is featured again in the exhibition. He was the commissioner of, uh, well, he was a patron of uh, the French firm Cartier's largest jewelry commission ever, uh, in which he ordered his uh, state uh, his jewels from his family's treasury to be reset by Cartier, and this is one of the necklaces that is the prize of that commission, and uh, you can come see it in the exhibition, along with a video of his son wearing that uh, uh, necklace in one of the state uh, events. Okay. <coughs> Gertrude Bell, uh, the writer that I just uh, mentioned, has described in her diaries and letters that her tent had two rooms. She divided one space with a curtain into a sitting room and a bedroom, and the other was a bathroom. She, like other guests, had three attendants assigned to her. So uh, this is her brother, and he accompanied her to the event, and uh, this is probably the, uh, the tent that, you know, uh, he belonged to. So as the other thing to keep in mind is for all of these preparations, it's 1902, 1903, so when we just think about all the plumbing that you would need for having a bathroom in every tent is uh, really quite uh, amazing. And uh, among other amenities, Bell reports having an oil stove in her tent that made it warm and cozy in the Delhi winter, because this is December and Delhi if, uh, gets really cold in December, especially at night, so it's the peak of winter. And she mentions traveling in carriages to tents of other guests on the campsite, or by train to evening parties on the campsite in order to avoid the crush of carriages. Belle also reports not having to pay for anything herself, but recounts her conversation with the financial advisor of the Maharaja of Patiala, uh, whose uh, necklace we just saw. Uh, who, and this financial advisor was extremely indignant by the high expenditure his state was made to undergo while he and the Maharaja were, uh, and the administration, were trying to very hard to keep a bankrupt state solvent. So, um, you know, there is this tension that becomes evident all throughout this whole event. So the event began on December 29, 1902, and people such as Bell lined up at 8.30 in the morning to await the arrival of the Viceroy and the procession. Lord and Lady Curzon, and Lady Curzon, by the way, was the daughter of a wealthy Chicago businessman. So uh, again, gives you a sense of this very wide-ranging network that is operative through this uh, international colonial uh, enterprise. So uh, Lord and Lady Curzon arrived at the railway station at 11.30, and they were received at the platform by, I quote, a brilliant group, uh, as in brightly colored and shiny. Um, here's the railway station. Adjectives such as brilliant, dazzling, resplendent, magnificent, splendor, and others in the same vein uh, recur repeatedly in most contemporary accounts. And uh, very soon after the Lord and Lady Curzon arrive at the train station, the Duke and the Duchess of Connaught arrived soon after, and they all mounted elephants and made their way to the amphitheater, which was the ceremonial center of the Darbar. The elephant procession, as you can see here, uh, was led by the premier princes of India, which, uh, and they were the, the Nizam of Hyderabad, the Maharaja of Mysore, and the Gaikwar of Baroda. 
And incidentally, and you probably already know this, but the Mar Maharaja of Mysore, for example, uh, Mysore is the state where um, uh, Bangalore is today, the tech capital. And so the royal family of Mysore uh, was very instrumental in making a whole series of uh, uh, reforms and educational as well as, as infrastructure reforms that enabled or do enable places like uh, Bangalore to emerge today um, uh, in the world economic and technology scene. Uh, the last guy, the Gaipur of Baroda, uh, was his family set up uh, institutions such as compulsory education for compulsory free education for everyone, especially the women. And he set up colleges. And today, the Baroda University uh, has a fine arts program from which most of India's uh, contemporary artists are either coming out of or, or are desirous of having an affiliation with. So uh, some of the, the in my initial uh, paragraph, I uh, mentioned that this colonial period kind of helps us even understand where India is today, and you know, it's the role of some of these uh, progressive and enlightened rulers who uh, set up the systems that have helped India today. So the, back to the procession and back to the journey from the railway station. We're still at the railway station and moving along on the elephants to the campsite, uh, or, I'm sorry, to the amphitheater. And the procession of the elephants uh, is uh, described in very florid prose uh, in the descriptive text that is uh, included in the coronation album. And I'll quote a bit of a long passage here. And I quote, to describe the f uh, even faintly the splendor of state entry and and its unparalleled gorgeousness as seen from the Juma Masjid. And this is the mosque that is on the other side of the plain. So what you're looking at here is the courtyard of the mosque. Uh, the uh, event happened to coincide with uh, the festival of Eid, the, um, <clears throat> marking it at the end of the month of uh, fasting of Ramadan. And so the, uh, while on the one hand there were the festivities going on on the other side of the uh, of the mosque on the other, well, on this side are the Eid prayers. So, uh, and uh, many of the photographers used the parapet on top of the um, uh, mosque to be able to get a bird's eye view into the um, plain below. So, anyhow, so the Jummah Masjid, uh, the unparalleled gorge gorgeousness as seen from the Jummah Masjid is far beyond the scope of these notes. The flower of the Indian nobility mounted on magnificent elephants, resplendent in crop of gold. With rich saddle cloths laden with priceless embroidery, sweeping the ground on either side. The howdahs and their princely occupants <coughs> jeweled with an empire's ransom. I love that phrase, bejeweled with an empire's ransom. Presented a spectacle so impressive and so overpowering, overpoweringly brilliant that the memory almost distrusts itself when recalling the splendor of the site." End quote. The state entry of the Viceroy in the elephant procession was followed by the opening of an art exhibition, which Curzon described in his inaugural speech as the amassing of all that is rare, beautiful, and exquisite in Indian craft. And this is, um, the opening ceremony and Curzon standing giving his speech. The writers for this album inform us that the whole of India had been searched and the choicest treasures were gathered together in a temporary structure that was specially built for this exhibition. So this is the temporary structure which got removed at the end of the uh, fortnight. The works of the native craftsmen were organized, and they actually had the native native craftsmen at work, so you know they could be uh, part of the display. And there's a whole other uh, set of things that one can go off into about this idea of the native craftsmen. Um, but I'll leave that aside for now. So uh, the works of the native craftsmen were organized into uh, the region and mediums. 
and they were included, uh, and they included displays such as the Bombay Room, and the Madras Room, and the Burma Room, and prizes were awarded to individual craftsmen. But the most important uh, ceremony of the Darbar proceeding itself, which took place on January 1st, 1903, uh, was the coronation uh, celebration itself. And on this occasion, from the same location uh, at where Queen Victoria had been proclaimed Queen Empress of India in 1877, His Imperial Majesty Edward VII was proclaimed King Emperor of India. And that's the pavilion uh, that you see. All the princes and native chiefs had been gathered to honor the new emperor, and they offered obeisance to him in the person of his viceroy. So uh, it was really Curzon that they all came to and bowed to the floor and um, <coughs> congratulated. Guests were seated in uh, the semicircular amphitheater that had been built for the 1877 Imperial Assembly. This ceremony was followed over the next several days by a state church service, various displays, extensive review of troops, and at this point I will show you uh, some clips of films. They together are about six minutes long, and if you get tired of them, let me know, and yeah, I'll just switch over. This is... Excuse me. Sorry, it's streaming. I thought we had already taken care of that, but it's doing it again. Yeah, the audio is on. We could hear that. Oh, I need to play. That would help. I tried to embed the audio and it didn't work, but uh, so here is the uh, display of elephants and you can see there are huge fleets of them. Um, note that uh, the elephants are very magnificently dressed up with uh, uh, embroidered cloths that was what uh, was commented upon by many of the reviewers uh, and so were the horses. And on top of the elephant is something called, is the elephant throne or the seat upon which the riders, uh, important riders sit. It's called the Hauda, and that's something again you will see in the exhibition when uh, you come to see it. There are different shapes and styles and fashions of the Hauda. <coughs> and it's a little hard to see on this 1903 film, but many of the elephants also have a ladder uh, that is uh, secured to their side. Keep an eye out for it. And that's how you get on and off the elephant. Yeah. There it is. And uh, for uh, royal riders, the uh, ladders are often uh, uh, encased in sheets of uh, decorated silver. And, oh, these were all the, so it starts out with the, the Viceroy uh, and his wife, followed by the Duke and Duchess of Connaught, and followed by the, uh, the Indian, they become the native princes by this point, so um, I forget how many there were by the end of 1947, but nearly 600 or so uh, Indian states of varying sizes so they all went in procession uh, in relative order of their rank and please don't quote me on the number of the states uh, but there were very many several hundred and then each uh, of the royal members would have a, uh, a retinue of their troops as well, which would be uh, on the horses. 
Oh, and that's a cannon. And I forgot to point out a, a carriage. It was the Landau that came just a little before. And um, carriages were also another uh, means of transportation that were added to uh, the Maharaja's uh, fleets. So who was watching? Uh, public. Anybody could come. There were Indians, uh, it's, it's, uh, there were lots of foreign visitors uh, who came from all over because it was a highly publicized event. People came from the United States, people came from various parts of Europe. It was the, the party of the year, you had to be there. Um, and I, if at any point you guys are interested in, do read through Gertrude Bell's uh, archives, they're available online. She is so fascinating, and the way she writes about the details of uh, the event are very interesting. You had a question? Um, the fact that you had to be there for so long, how did that express the lost? It really wasn't within their control not to show up. Oh, it, absolutely not. It was not at all in their control not to show up, and they were required to uh, come in in native dress and the most splendid native dress and what this is a complete aside but what uh, is surprising to me even today is um, and let me start the other video uh, as I speak So in 1851, there was a great exhibition in London. Uh, <clears throat> it was one of the World's Fairs, uh, and there was an India section in it. And uh, in the India section, I found an old uh, newspaper clipping fairly recently, or the image thereof. Uh, the display that was included in it is almost exactly like what I've seen in contemporary exhibitions of Indian courtly arts. You have a throne room ensemble, you have an elephant on a howdah with all of these elephant trappings. Nearby are displays of arms and armor. And I was thinking to myself, here we are 2009, and this is 1851. We could have just picked up exactly what the Victorian Albert Museum had done. It's the same thing. How, how have we moved? How have we shifted our perceptions? We really haven't. And yesterday, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody and we were talking about, you know, is there a Maharaja going to come to uh, the exhibition and uh, who will it be? And is, are we having a celebrity uh, member or not? And this person said as well, if, the, if we have a Maharaja or if a Maharaja does come to San Francisco and to the Asian Art Museum, well, then he has to look like a Maharaja. He can't be wearing any old tuxedo. He has to be wearing the finest, the most spectacular clothing so that he looks like a Maharaja. And how, again, is that different from the mandate that all of these people were given by Lord Curzon and all of the British authorities that they had to come and look the part? Um, in the 1911 uh, Darbar, and, and this, that's not the topic of this thing today, but we have a film uh, in the exhibition, a short film clip, where uh, the Maharaja of Baroda, who uh, I just showed you a, a photograph of, he was one of the three leading princes. He became the subject of a great deal of public attention and controversy because he did two egregious things. One was he said that he did not get the memo about uh, wearing native dress. So he, he wore a very simple white outfit and he had uh, carried a walking stick with him, which was extremely annoying to uh, the administration because he was not wearing a turban, he was not wearing his jewels, he was not wearing his brocaded traditional clothing, and he had the cheek to carry a walking stick. Anyhow, that's not enough. Um, 
uh, he, uh, they were all supposed to arrive at the, uh, at the dais because in 1911 the emperor himself, uh, King uh, George V was present. And so everybody was supposed to come up, uh, pay their respects, uh, and as they exited, they were supposed to keep bowing as they stepped back. Well, Sayajira of Baroda casually turns his back and he walks out. Oh boy, that was, you know, transgression extreme because how dare he uh, turn his back on his uh, emperor and empress. And he was um, accused of sedition and he was accused of being rebellious and so on and so forth. And he had to make many public apologies and just again say that he was sick and so he could not come to the rehearsals and he didn't know that there was a dress code and he didn't know that there was a particular protocol that he had to follow in order to enter and exit. So these kinds of little things um, were very, very symbolic and important. And just yesterday when I heard somebody talking about whoever this Maharaja would be and how they should look like a Maharaja, again, made me think, really, we, we haven't gone too far. So anyhow, that's a pet, personal pet peeve, and we can get back to <laughs> So uh, other parts of the festivities and the program included uh, amusements such as polo tournaments, uh, football and cricket games, a mock battle, and fireworks. And I love these fireworks. They are portraits. Um, and not to forget the state ball for 4,000 guests that was held at the Red Fort. Um, on another party that was uh, held uh, for Indian Honorary Knightly Orders, which was attended by 2,500 people, and many other private parties that were hosted each night. So um, there was a lot going on, and you needed lots of clothes. On January 10th, 1903, the Darbar was officially over with the departure of His Excellency uh, Lord Curzon. And this is the departure procession, the Duke of Connaught, and all the other attendees. The Darbar was extensively documented by members of international press, photographers, filmmakers, and you just saw two films, and through personal letters and diaries of the attendees. However, it was ambivalently received. Uh, on the one hand, Curzon was lavished with praise from many sides. The king acclaimed the magnificent success of the event and his peers in England, such as uh, Lord George Hamilton, wrote to Curzon congratulating him on, I quote, a rare achievement, unique in many respects, and you have as its creator and superintendent every reason to be proud, end quote. Yet this event is also described as an ego trip for Curzon, uh, who was criticized for a self-aggrandizement through this uh, darbar. And one, uh, one critic, even uh, dubbed, a contemporary critic, dubbed the event uh, Curzonization, uh, sorry, Curzonation, as opposed to coronation. Uh, and it's a term that continues to be mentioned in nearly every uh, account of the 1903 Darbar today as well. And uh, Gertrude Bell, too, wrote to her mother saying that the program had a large letter C on its cover and she was unsure whether it stood for Curzon or for Carnation. She also observed uh, Curzon's unpopularity amongst his peers in the British administration. Others have commented on the excessive spending that was necessitated by the lavish uh, arrangements and which expense was largely borne by the Indian rulers. And then the Darbar has also been framed against the backdrop of a famine uh, that wrapped much of India in 1902. So it's a very heavily loaded uh, topic. 
So apart from its ostentation and display elements, what was the significance of the Darbar? In order to understand this, we just need to go back a little bit, not only to the imperial ceremony of 1877 and, it, and its symbolism, that set the precedent in many ways for what happened in, uh, for the 1902 event, but also to the ceremonials of Indian rulers, in particular the, those of the, ceremon the ceremonials and uh, of the Mughal dynasty, and to the new position of the British in India after 1858. So to give some historical background, in 1857, as, and you probably don't need this historical background, but I'll say it anyway, uh, there were a series of uprisings, uh, the Sepoy Rebellion, the First War of Independence, uh, mutiny, whatever you want to call it, depending on your point of view, uh, which was against the growing control and oppression of the English East India Company. Um, oh, a point to note, again, aside, I had been repeatedly told by the British, uh, sorry, by the VNA, that it should be referred to as the English East India Company rather than the British East India Company. So as you talk about it in your classes and stuff, apparently there's a very technical uh, act of incorporation and when this uh, company was formed and what it's referred to as. So apparently it was never called the British East India Company and that was told no matter what the websites say and no matter what other uh, sources say, it is the English East India Company. So, anyhow. So uh, these uprisings, as you know, took place in many parts of India, focused mostly in northern India, where the East India Company um, had gradually amassed increasing control, not only over the trade and economic revenues, but also of, uh, you know, had greater power on the everyday administration of the kingdoms where they were um, present. And <clears throat> so after the East India Company's uh, military victory, the, the crown of uh, England stepped in to take charge. It removed both the company as well as the last Mughal emperor and incorporated India into the rule of the crown of England. So by the middle of uh, the 19th century, India's colonial society was marked by a sharp distinction between a small group that was, a uh, small Indian group, I guess, that was British in culture, and a quarter of billion Indians uh, whom the British effectively controlled. So in the two decades that followed the successful British military action in 1857, the older political and cultural orders of India, under the Mughals as well as under the independent local dynasties, was now replaced by a new order. The new order was based on a series of assumptions about the past and the present of India and the continued necessity and desirability of monarchical rule in India. The British rulers assumed that uh, Indians had lost their right to self-rule through their own weakness, uh, which had led them to be subjugated by foreign rulers that stretched back not only to the Aryan invaders of antiquity, but also to the more recent past, uh, which is the British conquest, uh, as well as the preceding imperial order in much of India, which is of the, Mughal of the Mughals. And so the British saw themselves and presented themselves as the legitimate successors of the Mughal emperors. They also, there was also a, uh, a system reorganization, uh, large scale, and as part of the system or reorganization, the relationship between the rulers, the British, and the ruled or the local kings had to be reframed. A few aspects of these are expressed in the appropriation of earlier established, uh, of, I'm sorry, of earlier Indian customs. And uh, what had happened was that established older kingdoms uh, and ruling families were recognized by the British. New rulers were created. The British uh, awarded new honors and status to local rulers based on a number of criteria. And some of these criteria included the degree of loyalty that was shown to the British in the uprisings of 1857-58, uh, 
the date at which uh, a given kingdom ha may have become an ally of the British, uh, the size and wealth of the kingdom, the family and its dynastic lineage, etc. And so based on all of these criteria, these, uh, the local kings were uh, organized into a ranking system. They were awarded uh, titles such as Raja, Nawab, Rai Sahab, Rai Bahadur, Khan Bahadur. They were presented with uh, robes and uh, other robes of honor and other emblems. They were awarded special privileges and exemptions. Uh, rulers were uh, awarded also the practice of firing gun salutes uh, as a mark of respect. The highest of which was the 21 gun salute, which was uh, reserved to Queen Victoria or the, the ruler. And in 1861, a new Royal Order of Indian Knights was established. And by 1877, there were several hundred holders of uh, knighthoods that were granted by uh, Victoria. These awards and privileges were conferred upon the recipients at assemblies called the Darbar which is not only this type of uh, imperial darbar, but uh, other royal assemblies that were held in local kingdoms and in various other places. And uh, it was called the darbar after the central ritual of incorporation at the Mughal court, and uh, uh, a practice that was also used by the 18th century Indian rulers, both Hindu and Muslim. At the Mughal darbar, At the Mughal Darbar, which was regulated by a codified system of etiquette, one of the key ceremonials was the ritual act of incorporation. And this becomes a little tricky and kind of esoteric, but uh, it was still a very uh, well understood system by all those who were involved in it. So the person honor, uh, to be honored by the ruler would offer the ruler a gift, uh, typically of gold coins or some other valuables. It was called nazar. And he would in turn receive a robe of honor, a peshkash. And the robe itself was called a khila. These symbolic presentations constituted the relationship of giver and receiver. And they were not simply understood as an exchange of goods and valuables. So the robe of honor, or the khila, was a symbol of the idea of continuity, continuity and succession. And it rested on, and that's where this here is where it becomes a little uh, esoteric, is that it rests on the physical basis and depends on the contact of the body of the recipient with the body of the donor, which uh, bond is established and maintained through the medium of clothing. And so, um, the recipient was thus incorporated into the body of the donor. So he was not merely a servant of the king, but he was really a part of the king. Um, and the offering of gold coins to the ruler by the subordinate was a symbol of the acknowledgement of the ruler as being the protector, of being uh, the one responsible for the well-being uh, of all of his uh, subjects. These acts were uh, acts of obedience and pledges of loyalty for the subordinate, who was not, as I said, not only simply a servant of the king, but he was a part of the king. And for the ruler, they were the act acceptance of a responsibility and a acknowledgement of a superior position, uh, which brought along with uh, just that act of acknowledgement a great deal of responsibility. The British in the 17th and 18th century tended to misunderstand these ceremonials. They saw them as economic in nature and function, which for them translated into bribery and corruption. By the late 18th century, however, the British realized that loyalty had to be symbolized to be effective in the eyes of the, their subordinates and followers. And they too began to accept gifts and bestow robes of honor in formal meetings that could be recognized as, by the Indians as darbars. The Mughal ritual was therefore retained, but its meanings had changed. What had become a ritual of incorporation had now become a ritual of subordination. And there was no symbolic bonding between the royal figure and the chosen friend or servant of the king. After 1858 and the exile of the Mughal emperor, 
uh, the new order that was put in place needed a new center. And it required a means by which Indians could relate to this center. And, so, and there was a need to develop a ritual expression of British authority in India. So thus comes the, and here's where the important symbolic role of the 1877 Darbar comes in. And for example, um, the city, the site for this that was chosen was not Calcutta, which was the British capital in Delhi, but it was Delhi, uh, I'm sorry, British capital in India, but instead it was Delhi, which was uh, the Mughal power, the seat of power from which uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last emperor, had been exiled to Burma and was det dethroned. The imperial ceremonies were also held on a nearby ridge, uh, which had, uh, had were held on the site, which was nearby a ridge, uh, where, uh, which was the scene of one of the great British victories of the mutiny or the uprising. And so in this way, the British were claiming the geography of the land that they now came to inhabit uh, for the creation of a new British history of India. The Viceroy, Lord Lytton, who had organized this 1877 event, had already concluded that in Indian minds, small favors and marks of honor are quite as high, highly prized and appreciated as the more substanti substantial benefits. And he was confident that the power of ritual was uniquely appealing to the native mind. So the power relationships were forged uh, through other aspects of this uh, ceremonial. And while some of these had already been operative at the traditional court, and these included regulating the clothes that local rulers could wear. Uh, as I've said before, they were all required to dress in their native costume in all the brilliance of oriental splendor. And here they are. These are photographs that accompany this, uh, uh, <coughs> the introductory part of the Coronation Album of 1903. Uh, they were regulated in the weapons that they could carry, the number of retainers who could accompany them, uh, where they were met by British officials, uh, whether the Viceroy could come forward to greet them, etc. So there was a whole list of, again, the big and small things that really reminded them of their rightful place in the hierarchy. The Darbar was uh, also not an em empty ceremonial, but had to have tangible, associate, uh, tangible benefits associated with it. So uh, the British authorities awarded titles, awarded pensions, gave tax exemptions and other types of concessions, and ordered the release of prisoners at each of these events. Lord Curzon and Lord Harding, who was the organizer of the next Dakar, the 1911, used aspects of the earlier precedents of Indian and British assemblies uh, to craft their own pageants. These displays were intended as much to legitimize and reinforce the presence of the Raj in India as they were to impress the British citizens back home, to place themselves within the traditions of the land that they governed, and also to maintain their position of superiority over the local rulers. At one level, these efforts were not successful because India did eventually gain independence from the British. But whether or not these uh, elaborate ceremonials fulfilled the goals of their organizers is a matter of continuing debate. And the subject is fascinating and far too complex to really be done justice to in such a short overview talk. But I hope that this has served as a general introduction to themes and uh, many of the ideas and objects that you will be encountering through uh, this institute as well as seeing in the exhibition. And uh, also applying to other um, manifestations of colonial power. There's so many parallels uh, between what goes on in India with what goes on in Africa, for example. And this uh, colo colonial enterprise, again, you know, it's just uh, continues to fascinate me with the ways in which people move and go around, you know, uh, political authority of British uh, in Canada, 
then brings them to uh, places like India, where they've already then moved up to a higher level. Then they get back posted to England and they become members of the parliament. And then they become, uh, through that all of that experience, they end up as being very instrumental in the various treaties and negotiations that were taken over uh, either World War One or World War Two, and especially World War II, uh, where you know the Middle East was carved out into the ways in which we are still reeling from the impacts of. And many of the names that appear in uh, Indian history show up in all of the documentation and all of the negotiations that are happening in the 40s, mid 40s, over. Um, how to how to deal with the collapse of uh, imperial authority, or not even if it, in the Middle East was never officially imperial, but you know how do you work all of that out? So the implications of all of this are really very uh, manifold, manifest, and deep down. You know, even things like uh, these botanical gardens, they're scientific labs. Uh, of a glorified form. On the outside, they are uh, beautiful gardens, but they're also imperial uh, displays of imperial majesty. Here we can grow everything that we have uh, brought together from the far corners of the earth, and we bring them to you. The zoos are another thing. Um, and on the back, there, there are ways in which how can rubber be crafted from what is not Dutch colony but into British colonies so that we, the British are no longer dependent on the Dutch in order to gain economic advantage over the European peers. Uh, the, the French and British rivalries play out completely in India and Africa and in parts of Asia. So it's, it's really very complex and fascinating and I'm excited by the topic. I know very little about it, but uh, it's just so rich that there just you keep finding new and new layers. So, thank you for your attention and thank you for being here. And I hope you have fun with this topic as, as it deserves. Thank you. Now, many of these images are also available online. Uh, not only, uh, so there were several versions of these uh, coronation albums that are out there. And uh, as, you know, just from that one photograph of the members of the press, it was a very widely covered event. So uh, there are many different uh, angles and many different shots that have been selectively compiled into albums. We have one example in the collection, but there are uh, other pictures that I found online um, that come from this album and but are not in the museum's album. So if you do an online search for the Carnation Darbar, the two videos, uh, as you could also see, I found them on YouTube. So there is material out there. Even for the 1911 Darbar, uh, there are clips available on YouTube. I love you too. <laughs>